for our um, second panel discussion of the day. We're going to be looking at some uh, people, careers of people who have worked in startups. Um, we've got three panelists with us. We have Bridget Riley uh, from SpaceX, Kyle Tate from Shopify, and Jorge Escobedo from um, Canopy Labs. Um, so much like we did this morning, I'll first start by asking um, our panelists to tell, them, tell us a little bit about themselves and uh, their career. And then at any point, you can come up to the mic and we can take, take your questions. Um, so maybe you guys can just tell us a little bit about how you went from physics into, into startups and a little bit about your, your career and, and your story. Do you, so we start with you? Sure. Um, so I actually didn't start in physics. I actually started in aerospace engineering. I wanted to fly the space shuttle. Turns out you need to be 5'4". I'm 5'1". <laughs> uh, so I ended up switching into aerospace engineering and then went into guidance, navigation, and control. Did that for a defense company for a while. Realized it really wasn't me, but I loved the technical aspect of my job. Um, so then I actually came here as part of the PSI program. Um, fell in love with that, um, but wasn't sure if I was really a theory person or an engineering hands-on person and was kind of torn between the two. Um, so I applied to some doctoral programs as well as uh, some fast-paced companies because I didn't really want to go back to defense and ended up getting a job at SpaceX. Um, and so I worked at a test site facility. I ran the propellant densification program uh, for a couple years and switched over to uh, high accuracy measurement for specific impulse for rockets. Um, then I moved out to Hawthorne and I'm doing um, automation primarily. And we launched uh, 18 times last year, two times the first year I started and this year we're targeting 31 launches. So the pace is exponentially grown there. And so automation is a huge thing that I'm working on right now. So when you were making that decision between the doctoral program and the fast paced companies, you know, that's, they're quite different. Like how did you, how did you kind of navigate that choice? I, SpaceX is incredibly fast paced, like she had mentioned. Um, and then when densification kind of came to a lull, I realized I actually missed my doctoral program. So I enrolled in a doctoral program and I'm doing that concurrently full time. Oh, so you decided so to do both. So I kind of did both. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to make the choice, just yep. do both. Yeah. Exactly. Kyle, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, yeah, so I, I did my undergrad in physics. Um, I was on my way to do particle physics in the States. And then I saw a talk by Lee Smolin in Toronto, I guess it's 2008, and he was talking about this thing called PSI, and I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. So, cut and run on the States and came here and had an amazing, amazing year uh, doing the first year of PSI. Um, I've known how awesome Imogen has been for nine years, so I'm ahead of you guys on that. Um, and uh, after that, I went and did uh, my PhD in New Zealand. After two years, I actually came back to Perimeter uh, on a visiting fellowship, and sort of at that time, starting to realize that I don't think academia is for me. Um, so I uh, kind of naively and stupidly <laughs> just sort of dropped out of my PhD and came back to Canada and looked for jobs on Craigslist. And uh, luckily my, my boss at the NDP didn't know where to advertise for jobs. You're supposed to do on like LinkedIn, on Monster. <laughs> um, uh, but he advertised only on Craigslist and I was the only one looking on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he got a a uh, statistical analyst for um, the BC provincial election in 2013. Um, and it was right after the Obama 2012 stuff when they're like, oh, we should A-B test landing pages. Um, we should apply data-driven stuff to try and maximize our fundraising. Um, and so we were the first Canadian election after that sort of craze hit. Um, and so I got a chance in that job to learn how to do A-B testing, um, did some machine learning to optimize uh, our fundraising asks, um, to optimize where we should send direct mail, where we should send uh, telephone asks. Um, and I did that for the Green Party for three years. And then um, there's this big company uh, that needed data people in Ottawa called Shopify. I applied and got a job. So I've been there for two and a half years now. Okay, great. Jorge? Um, so I'm originally from Peru. 
Um, and uh, I got my bachelor's in physics there. Um, after that, I went to Amsterdam to do my master's uh, in theoretical physics. And then in 2009, I came to Canada to the Perimeter Institute to work on my PhD. Um, uh, during my PhD, I worked on uh, with Pedro Vieira, some of you uh, probably know him, on integrability in uh, ADS-CFT. Um, but then, two years into my PhD program, I realized that, uh, uh, yeah, I guess academia was not for me either, and I didn't want to do it long term. So, uh, at that point, I decided that I was going to finish my PhD, but um, I was going to use the remaining year uh, of my PhD to uh, finish uh, a couple of, uh, or one paper that I was working on with a collaborator, but then at the same time start looking for what options were available out there for people with a PhD in physics. Um, and so back then, uh, the only two options known to me at least were to go into uh, finance, uh, to go work for a bank or a hedge fund, uh, or to go into management consulting. And so I was in the process of, um, I guess, getting ready, I was getting ready to apply for those type of jobs when a friend of mine who had finished his PhD uh, a year earlier here at PI as well, Jonathan Hackett, some of you may know him, um, uh, introduced me to who ended up being my, my co-founder at Canopy Labs. Uh, and so they had met when Jonathan interviewed at McKinsey, which is his big management consulting firm. They got along, they kept in touch, and when Wojciech, so Wojciech was working at McKinsey, Wojciech is my co-founder, um, and um, as a consultant, and he uh, had an idea to start a company, and he was looking for someone to start working uh, uh, on the idea with. Uh, we met, we got along, uh, and after only knowing each other for maybe a total of eight hours that we had spent together, we decided to start working on Canopy. <laughs> Um, and so that was back in 2012, um, and that's how I ended up making the transition from uh, physics, academia, to, I guess, the tech startup world. Yeah, so um, it sounds like, Bridget, you sort of had like experience in industry right from the get-go, like before starting Sci. but for the, for the two of you, maybe, were there any fear of leaving academia? Were you, was the transition um, you know, you said you, Kyle, you realized it just wasn't for you. Like, what, what was part of that decision? Yeah, I think there should have been more fear than there actually was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in retrospect, when I look back, I'm like, how did I just walk away um, from it? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I've been lucky in, in the career opportunities I've received, but at the same time, like, you know, there's all these companies who are here today to talk about jobs because they want your talent, so um, I think... Uh, there's so many opportunities to jump into stuff as long as you know where to look. Um, I think anyone who wants to make that choice is going to land on their feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I was scared. I was... Um, it was a mix of being excited, but also a bit um, nervous about the ultimate outcome of, of my, I guess, job search back then. Um, but I, w I wouldn't say I was scared. I was... It was very clear to me that I didn't want to stay in academia after my PhD. Mm -hmm. So once I made up my mind, uh, uh, I guess like most people in this room, uh, like I had that problem in front of me, which was to find a job outside of academia. So I just focused on, on that. Yeah, and I, I have to say I got, I was lucky enough um, to meet someone that uh, I hit it off with and uh, because it's, when people, when you talk with people that have built companies before, uh, they do tell you that you have to be very careful and selective when you choose uh, your co-founders. And so in our case, uh, again, we only had spent eight hours together and we decided to work together. Uh, it turned out to, it worked out in the end, but um, uh, there was a good dose of luck, yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, so feel free to come down and uh, ask questions at any, at any point. Um, but maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about what you actually do day to day. Um, Bridget, I don't know if you have any. Um, let's see, day to day varies a lot. Currently, 
its automated data review. We're cutting our department significantly because we want to move to Mars. And so what we're doing right now with the Falcon missions, we have to retire, which means our workforce there needs to cut down to pilot, co-pilot. You have two people flying a rocket. So I'm never bored. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I work on, on the, I lead a data science team that is <clears throat> essentially trying to use uh, machine learning, but really um, like textbook 1980s machine learning, not this deep learning stuff. We're, we're trying to hit that sweet spot between um, uh, predictive value and just being able to get it into the product. So um, uh, one of the products I work on is a product called Shopify Capital, which is really, really cool. Um, essentially, the experience for the merchants on our platform is you log into Shopify one day, there's a little card that says, hey, you're eligible for $10,000 uh, in working capital. Do you want that? And they say, yeah, sounds good. I need that to help grow my business. I need to buy some marketing, stock up inventory. They click a button, the next day um, they've got the money in their account and they can start uh, using it. And then over the next 10 months to a year as they make sales, we take 10% of their daily sales until they pay off the advance. Um, and uh, then once they do that, you know, we can renew and keep, and, and keep that working capital uh, arrangement. Um, so basically the task there is, is a prediction of over the next 10 months, based on what we've seen from this business, um, how do we think their sales are going to grow so that we can accurately give them the amount of money that makes sense for, for their future sales. Um, and then we also um, do uh, online fraud prediction. So every transaction that goes through Shopify, our algorithms are scoring and saying, do we think this is a fraudulent transaction or not? Um, and that sounds like a pretty vanilla classification problem, and it kind of is. Um, there's some problems in that uh, uh, it could take up to two years for us to know if we were right or not, because it takes a long time for these chargebacks to come in. Um, it's also very unbalanced, you know, one to 10,000. So there's some really difficult things. And then we also need to get these algorithms that we train and all the scientists know how to use and get them into production so that we're scoring thousands of times every minute. Um, so that, those are sort of the two main things that my team's working on right now. Great. Um, so I don't, have, I don't think I have a typical day, um, but uh, I think the only constant uh, in my day to day is the morning. Um, uh, actually, let, let me take a step back. So I'm the CTO in, uh, at Canopy Labs. Uh, and so depending on um, uh, the company, the CTO might have different types of responsibilities. They might focus more on like on the software architecture side of things, or maybe they want to focus more on the um, team management side of things. In my case, um, I guess at a high level, I'm ultimately responsible for uh, everything tech at the company, which, in, which includes um, the engineering team, the data science team, and the product team. Um, um, saying that product is all tech is debatable, but just bear with me. Um, and so, uh, when I say that the only constant um, uh, in my day-to-day -day is the morning, it's because um, when I get in the, into the office, the first thing I do is I spend um, uh, time uh, replying to emails, writing emails, checking my inbox. Uh, and after that, I have um, uh, two uh, regular check-ins, one with the management team, with the rest of the management team. <laughs> Um, and uh, the second type is with people that I work directly with. Uh, so uh, the lead data scientist, the lead product manager, um, and our VP of engineering. Um, and so that usually, uh, uh, by that time, it's already noon. And then I usually like to save the afternoon to uh, try to uh, do more hands-on work. So uh, I've, uh, I was here in uh, Imogen, I think. Uh, uh, say that uh, as the company grows, she finds it more difficult to actually do research uh, and, do, and be hands-on uh, at work. Uh, so I've, I've gone through that as well. Uh, but um, recently I decided that uh, I can actually help the company by devoting a good percentage of my time uh, 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 to work directly with the data science team. So that's something that's a transition that I'm making right now. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's more or less what a day-to-day -day work uh, looks like for me. Uh, and I realize I haven't given you, uh, you probably know what SpaceX does and Shopify does. 
Um, uh, what we do at Canopy Labs or what we've built is a customer data platform um, and our users are market, marketers. Uh, so we are a B2B company, which means that we sell to businesses. Um, and so uh, the product or the platform that we've built helps marketing teams solve two problems. One is uh, to have a uh, unique source of truth for all their customer data. Um, and two is once they have all their customer data centralized in our platform, then uh, we have built features, many of which rely on machine learning, to uh, help our users uh, uh, make sense of that data and actually act on it. So uh, doing things such as uh, uh, optimizing their marketing campaigns when they send them uh, via marketing channel uh, to make sure that people, uh, their customers get them uh, the right time to maximize the chances of conversion and things like that. And so that's where all the machine learning um, uh, comes in in the context of Canopy. A few of the, the speakers have sort of echoed Mike Servinus's pit of despair. Do you mm. guys think you have been through one of those yet, or have you been fortunate to avoid a, uh, do you have a, a moment that you found was particularly challenging is maybe another way of saying it? Um, that propellant densification project was incredibly challenging. Um, and about, so it first came to me as like a science project. Is it actually possible? Is this something that we can do large scale? And I didn't realize how fast production was. Like we always said we were gonna ramp up launches and I didn't, the pace at which this grew just completely overwhelmed me. I think someone had spoken to this before where you don't get time to work on the details. And I think the majority of people here live in the details, love the analysis, want that precise number. And this was just rounding up, calling it good, and ordering the equipment. And that took a, a lot of effort for me to do. But yeah, I think it was in that time of we got it working on one site. All of a sudden, you need to do this four times larger in a fraction of the time. That was mm. incredibly challenging. It does sound challenging. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I've faced it in the sort of existential way that's been discussed so far, because <laughs> again, I'm not, I haven't started a company or anything. Um, but I, I do feel that every data science project has a valley to spare phase. Um, a lot of the times we hear the data set that's available, we hear what the task that we want to do with machine learning is, um, and it's like, okay, yeah, we should totally be able to do that. And then you start looking at the data and you're like, oh my god, it's so messy. <laughs> Nothing's what I thought it was going to be. Um, you know, the coders have changed the way they implemented this thing eight times over the last two years, and I need to trace back where that was. Um, and you essentially are just like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull any value out of this data set. Um, and, uh, and I think you face the same decision um, that others have talked about, which is, you know, and, and actually this is where I think physicists do make good data scientists is that they've probably had this experience in the research where it's, okay, grit your teeth, go back to first principles, classify the problems, fix one each at a time, eventually you get a nice uh, clean data set, and now machine learning can proceed and you can start extracting that value. So I do feel that, yeah, I think almost every project I've ever worked on has had a phase where someone's had to grit their teeth and do some annoying work that doesn't seem glamorous, but the people who have done that have then gone on to be quite successful, I think. Oh, absolutely, yes, quite a few times, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, th I think uh, um, being a co-founder of, of a company is an incredible journey, uh, but the highs and the lows get amplified a thousand X uh, when, when you, you are part of the co-founding team. Uh, because while, um, at least at Canopy, uh, uh, we do try to be transparent with our team, uh, and be very open with them in terms of how the business is doing and, and so on. There are times where uh, we have to keep some things uh, within the co-founding team uh, because we know that um, if the rest of the team were to find out, uh, they would get demotivated, for example, right? Um, so a good example is, of that is like, if one of your uh, uh, biggest customers, for example, just gave you notice that they're gonna cancel, uh, soon, or uh, one of the best members of your team 
just gave you uh, uh, their two or three week notice because they, they decided to pursue another opportunity. Uh, and yes, that we've, I've faced that several, several times. Which is where I think having a network or having at least a few or even a couple of trusted advisors uh, or friends that ideally have gone through the same uh, things uh, become, it becomes incredibly valuable, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and which is why, uh, I think in an, in, in an earlier talk, uh, someone said this, which is why starting a company as a solo founder is also so difficult because you don't have uh, uh, other people to go through, those, through that process with. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, maybe you want to say a little bit since you were part of you know, developing the company, like um, what was that like going from the idea to actually mm -hmm. having the company, like those ah. first steps? Yeah. Uh, so like I said a few minutes ago, the original idea for Canopy um, uh, was from Wojciech, uh, my co-founder, um, because, and the idea was the following. So he had spent, uh, I think, a year and a half or two years at McKinsey as a management consultant as part of their IT uh, practice in Toronto. Um, and so he had noticed that um, time and time again, uh, he was working on similar projects for different clients of McKinsey. And his hypothesis was that uh, one could build um, a platform that uh, would speed up the process to complete those type of projects. And the projects were very much using machine learning to solve a business problem, right? And so when you spend, as a management consultant, um, I don't know, several months, maybe even several years working on a specific project, you can build an extremely accurate uh, machine le learning model that solves um, the problem for that institution very accurately, right? Uh, but the hypothesis that uh, Wojciech had back then uh, and that we discussed when we met was how can we build uh, a platform uh, that uses machine learning to build models that are good enough for the majority of uh, their users, uh, or of, of its users? Uh, so that was the ideal, uh, the initial hypothesis. And um, uh, I think a day after we started, we decided to, to work together back in 2012, we actually um, filled out an application for Y Combinator, which is uh, this startup incubator uh, in um, Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, actually quite well known. Um, so we filled out the application uh, and uh, we submitted the application and uh, luckily we got in. Uh, and so the summer of 2012, we spent uh, down in Mountain View uh, uh, as part of the Y Combinator summer of 2012 class. Uh, and you can think of it as um, a startup boot camp, basically. So uh, we spent three months down there and we, uh, I guess, worked 110 plus hours a week. It was literally, we would just wake up, um, have breakfast, start working, and then keep working until we fell asleep at night. Uh, and that was for three months. It's not sustainable, of course. Um, and, uh, but the program was incredibly helpful because it helped, it helped us uh, refine the original idea. And so the idea that um, we came out with at the end of that program um, was different from the original one. Uh, we had changed uh, our target market, for example. Originally, we uh, mistakenly thought, like hindsight uh, it was a fairly uh, naive, assumption, but we, we thought that this type of platform would be useful for small and medium-sized businesses. But of course, we ignore the fact that when you're a small and medium-sized business owner, you have like a thousand different issues that you have to fix before you can even think about using machine learning powered features, right, to optimize your email campaigns. You don't even have a subscriber list. Um, and so we refined our, uh, our uh, I guess, value proposition. Uh, we identified um, our target market uh, more precisely. 
Uh, and so the program was incredibly, incredibly helpful in, in, in that sense. And after that, we decided to come back to Toronto um, and we raised uh, our uh, seed round of uh, financing. And we've been growing the company since then uh, um, out of our office in downtown Toronto. Uh, and so if, if, I had, if I had to give a piece of advice in terms of how do you go from having an idea to actually starting a company, um, I'd say there are three things. So one, um, uh, accelerators or incubators. Uh, so all of you are incredibly privileged to be uh, in Waterloo uh, because of its startup, if you're interested in tech um, and in the startup world, because of the uh, startup ecosystem that exists here. So um, like you heard in the previous two talks, uh, if you're interested, if you have an idea uh, or, in your interest, or you're interested in potentially working for a, a tech company, a, start, uh, a startup, uh, leverage all the um, help that you can get from Communitech, from uh, Velocity, and so on. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second one are uh, online resources. Um, uh, so Y Combinator, for example, has, if you go to ycombinator.com, they have a lot of incredibly useful resources for people that uh, have an idea and are thinking about starting a company. And the third one is to um, just let people in your network know that you're thinking that you have an idea, that you're interested potentially in uh, exploring, in exploring uh, how to start a company. And chances are that uh, you'll have a few people in your network that have either done it or could introduce you to someone uh, who have. Awesome, thanks. Yes, a question. Hi. Um, I'm very curious about work-life balance, particularly for SpaceX because there are rumors, but I'd, I'd really love you to comment in general. Startups have a, a real reputation for eating your life. I was wondering how that was experienced by each of you. Um, it's not easy, but I will say you get what you ask for. I tend to work at a very high pace and need to be challenged 24-7 and I got more than I could chew. They just keep feeding. You have one success, you get three more projects. Um, so it's a product of your success and the hunger that you have to work on a project. So I would say I've been fortunate the most because I've gone after a ton of these things. Um, but, and that's led me to, you know, I need to rec I learned pretty quickly recognizing when I need to delegate and relinquishing some of that, some of the really cool technical aspects of certain projects that I would really love to do, but my time is more valuable delegating and mentoring key people in my group to then take over certain projects. Um, and so that was incredibly challenging for me, and that came out of necessity, just biting off way more than I could chew. Um, and people joke, but I did take a three-month leave. Well, I didn't take any vacation for about two and a half years. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, but I, when I went back to school, they required at least one semester there. So I took vacation to go back to school, which sounds entertaining, but it was a break. It was different. But it was the respite that I needed from, I was out in Texas sun 24-7 turning wrenches. And it was a relief to be back in academia for a while. Um, and then I took another month break after that. And having that reset and realizing I need to delegate more, that was key to future success and not getting burnt out and leaving the company because it is pretty typical, I think, for several of my peers not learning that lesson or um, you know, finding another project either at another company or um, just a new career path in general. Yeah, I mean, I guess you probably think I would say this, but <laughs> Shopify is actually uh, pretty amazing at work-life balance. Um, as I've become a lead and taken on a team, um, you know, it's part of been part of my training uh, as becoming a manager. Like, you know, I, I hire people who want to work hard, and so like, I'm not having to say, "Hey, can you work more?" I'm having to say, "Hey, can you work less?" So like, if I notice someone on my team's on Slack, it's like 8 p.m. It's like, "Hey, log off, stop working." <laughs> Um, it's, I think it's really important because uh, I, I think people found, you know, if, if you work that many hours straight, you're just going to burn out and oh, go find a company that 
will let you not have to do that and still have a good career there. Yeah. Um, as soon as the company like says for you to have a good career, you need to work this hard. There's other companies you can go to that. Um, that's not the case, and, and Shopify has come down on the right side of that. So my work-life balance is actually pretty great. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, um, during the first maybe two, two and a half years, uh, it was pretty bad <laughs> in my case, in that um, I, well, there were two, two problems. Uh, one is uh, I, I had no training based on my, uh, I guess, experience or time in academia, uh, or I had not learned how to manage my time uh, and manage my day-to-day. -day. Uh, and I had not learned uh, how to prioritize my tasks or projects. And so that made it more difficult. That coupled with the fact that, uh, I mean, when you're a very early stage startup, you, you just wanna get things done quickly, you wanna move fast, uh, made it such that the first two, two and a half years were pretty tough in terms of work-life balance. Uh, but after that, uh, well, I, I recognized that it was becoming an issue for me, uh, and so I dialed it uh, down a bit. Um, so nowadays, I would say that we, um, we do encourage everyone to have a healthy work-life balance. Uh, like Kyle was saying, uh, I think our recruiting process is such that people that we actually end up uh, uh, making offers to and that join the team uh, uh, work hard. Uh, um, and so yeah, I often find myself having to also tell them to yeah, just dial down or log out of Slack, for example, if they're there at 9, 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, do you guys have like sometimes people want we, we talked about this morning some people were saying their x factor like beyond physics is there a skills if you're hiring or if you're looking for a new person on your team uh, beyond physics that maybe physics people tend to not have or things that people should consider developing if they want to succeed in a in a startup i personally look for folks that are highly motivated and have tackled some project. It could be in unicycle competitions or building their own car. Like it, it doesn't have to be technical. It could be artistry, but someone that shows that they have a passion for something and went outside maybe their scope and just went after it, self-taught, found their mentors, folks that are self-motivated like that. The, to me, that's I've seen those individuals succeed more than their peers. And reining them back is always way easier than trying mm -hmm. to be like, all right, let's get going. And mm -hmm. I would say 1% of the folks I work with are in that category. The majority of people are, you need to work on the work-life balance. Like, I know you love this, but mm -hmm. there's other sides of it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, um, at, at least for, for what I do in data science, I think is a, is a really good career for everyone in this room. Um, you know, like, there's hard skills. The better you are at Python, Great, better yard SQL, awesome. Um, but it, I don't think that's necessary. Um, as I was saying before with the, the Valley Despair, the, the people who do well are the people who fall in love with whatever problem they're trying to tackle. Um, and I also think that that's something that physicists do because we find this you know, niche little problem. I'm gonna put a bunch of triangles together and do some simulation that's gonna let me calculate an expectation function. Um, and we'll spend three years doing it. <laughs> uh, anyone who can bring that drive and motivation that they have for their research to whatever problem um, they're going to be working on um, is going to be someone who's successful. Uh, the, the, where I find people are not successful is the, I know the math, I know the stats, this is all just math and stats, and then they ship a model that's terrible because they don't understand that uh, it, you know, the effect on some sliver of the population is, is terrible. So. The people who are going to fall in love with problems and, and show that commitment, I think, is the most important, most important thing I look for. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, there, if, if I have much to add to what uh, Bridget and Kyle just said. Um, yeah, I think Sonia was talking about this earlier, and it, it's this ability to uh, almost translate uh, your work and explain it to uh, someone that has no idea 
or no training in, in your field. I think that's incredibly valuable uh, in like, data science, for example, I, I've, I've found. Um, and uh, in terms of hard skills, I, th I realize this, this is not fair to ask uh, from some candidates. But ideally, if, um, for example, I, I um, get an application from someone who uh, uh, is just finishing a PhD or a master's, uh, I would like to see, uh, I guess to Bridget's point, a project there that is outside of, uh, uh, that is, has nothing to do with uh, their uh, academic work. Uh, because that to me shows that they're motivated, uh, that they take initiative, um, and that they're really committed to uh, making the transition. Um, so, and, yeah, and, and this is also related to uh, um, coming up with an idea to start a company. It doesn't really have to be related to your research work. It's, then that's particularly true for people that do research in, in this building. Um, like I did integrability in ADS CFD, right? So like what type of company would, we, would I be able to build using uh, my research work? Uh, none, right? Uh, but so if, if you're interested in, in making the transition or even like uh, you wanna fiddle with the idea of, um, of starting a company, choose one problem that you think you can solve with technology. And by technology, I mean, in most cases, code, like writing uh, uh, code. Um, and if it's a problem that you experience on a daily basis and that people close to you also experience, even better. Um, then, then just build something, hack away. Yeah, I, I think the value of your experiences aren't uh, your successes, the, the mistakes. Um, you, yeah. <laughs> your, your career opportunities and your salary are gonna be directly proportional to the mistakes you've made on yeah. someone else's books. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> um, the more you can make on your own time, uh, the better. Um, so like, uh, you know, I, I talked to someone who wanted to get into uh, data science and, you know, the thing that they were really passionate about was uh, rap. And so they, they just had a side project, which was like, I'm going to go over uh, Rap Genius, I think it's called, mm -hmm. get all of the lyrics, which are already labeled as what their category of rap is, and then just build a classifier, put in a lyric, and they'll tell me what, what uh, type mm -hmm. of rap it is. Um, just doing that, you're gonna make all of the mistakes you would make on six months yeah. into any job. So uh, the more you can find a data set, like uh, take archive data set and try and predict based on the text, the number of citations it's gonna get or something. Mm. Um, that's, that's gonna be so much more powerful than any yeah. Udemy course or anything else. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Question, yes. I have a question. Oh, sorry, oh, I couldn't see uh, on my side. Sorry, so Tibra. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, the question's for Bridget. I know that uh, you came from not more of an aeroscience background, and then you did the PSI, which is more of a theoretical physics, and then you considered for a while going into doing a PhD in, th in theoretical physics, but then you got the SpaceX job. So um, what I'm curious about is that how much of this kind of diversion into theoretical physics or physics has helped you directly or indirectly in your career path? I would say um, it would be kind of two parts. PSI taught me you're not gonna be the smartest person in the room, nowhere close to it. And working with individuals and not being afraid to ask questions really helped me when I was in Texas, when I didn't know what I was, there's no answer to the problem, but I need help and being not unafraid to reach out to folks that might know better. Um, so that was a skill I didn't really expect to get from PSI. And then in California, um, we're just starting data science and I'm trying to lead that effort. And at least in the propulsion side of things. Um, I do modeling and simulation, so I'm trying to combine data-driven and model-based uh, predictions. And my mathematical foundations from PSI have been exceedingly important because the majority of people I work with are mechanical engineers or aerospace engineers, they're engineers. A small percentage are physicists. Um, the physicists are in the avionics department, um, I guess at least the ones I know. 
um, don't work too much with trying to build some data science tools, but I work in software and I've been able to leverage the mathematics I learned at PSI. That's the only place I really learned statistics um, and yeah, leveraging that. And a lot of the projects I learned on my own um, did try to push that over in the data science department there. Um, speaking of things that academia doesn't prepare you for, like time management and prioritization, as you said, what are some of the other examples uh, of that sort, and how do you navigate when those are thrown at you? Um, is the question, what, what are some of the things that I've had to learn uh, when making the transition? Um, For me, I think the most challenging thing that I've had to do, and I still do at Canopy, is uh, to build and lead uh, a team. That's incredibly difficult. Um, you're dealing with uh, people, <laughs> and uh, people have emotions, uh, have uh, uh, potentially problems at home, uh, you don't know what's going on in their lives sometimes. Uh, and so learning how to build and lead teams has been the most challenging thing that I've had to learn at, at Canopy, but also the most rewarding as well. Because um, once you bring someone on board, uh, you're bringing someone on board because you think that they're well aligned with the company core values. You think that they're going to uh, uh, strengthen uh, the culture of the company and seeing them thrive uh, and ideally playing at least a, a small role in their growth uh, is incredibly rewarding. Yeah. I think um, for me, the, hard, the hardest thing to learn was, uh, and I think this actually, this is um, maybe one of the weaknesses of, of physics as a background is that before we show people our work, we want it to be perfect. Um, mm. And we don't iterate. Uh, and so, you know, I, when I started on a project, I'd want to spend six months on it, get a really deep dive, understand it super well, and then, like, build this amazing Cadillac that was going to solve every single problem at once. And then when I'd show them, people would, like, clap their hands, and that would be awesome. Uh, it's much better to do 10% of that in a couple days, get it in get it working, and then iterate on it. Um, and I think that as, as, when, when people come from academia onto my team, that is actually the, the main thing I have to work on is, is just, it's okay to have something that you don't like. <laughs> as long as it works okay, and then you can make it better. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think that I was ever prepared to do that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that's one of the challenges as you go into industry, I think. One of the things that I don't see too often is, or at least with new hires, is a willingness to reach out to other groups. Um, and I think I saw that in some previous academic experience as well. You're in an aerospace engineering department, you talk to aerospace engineers. You're in theoretical physics, you talk to theoretical physicists. It's, but I see it more with younger folks um, or early careers. And same thing at SpaceX, we have tons of different departments and reaching out to avionics or ground software or someone at the Cape is invaluable. And getting out of your comfort zone, you may not know what they're doing over there, but chances are they tackle similar problems and they've already done the same thing. They've reiterated on those <laughs> solutions over there. So not just in your own team reiterating, but reaching out to other groups and, you know, hey, I know nothing about guidance and navigation. Can you teach me? Have you had this software problem? How do you automate your data review? You know, things like that. Um, getting comfortable with networking in the same company in different departments. Let's say there was, uh, you were, you know, in the PhD or you had a PhD candidate come to you and be like, I'd really like to work at a startup. I'd love to work at SpaceX, at Shopify. I'd love to work in Toronto at a, st a startup or here in Waterloo. Um, you know, what should I do? Should I be reading Craigslist? Should I uh, be, you know, should I be just sending my CV out to applications? Should I call people? What is the way to get into the industry? 
Yes. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you have friends and networking and just, I think you had mentioned it earlier, just let people know you're open to that idea and you'll have friends say, oh man, I really want to start up with two and I really like this aspect of technology. Oh, I really like software. We need both, let's chat. Um, some of the most fruitful conversations I had are in situations like that. Um, but applying for jobs, um, I guess on Craigslist that work too, so. <laughs> Keep your options open. Yeah. Yeah. Any avenue like that I think is, is very useful, but for me personally, the most fruitful ones have been just kind of networking with folks at the lunch table or yeah, wine and cheese or something here, just start chatting with people. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is um, if you apply to like, you know, start applying to companies like Shopify or SpaceX or, you know, Uber, Google, uh, Facebook, um, apply multiple times. Um, the, those HR departments are getting a deluge of resumes um, and, uh, you know, as fast as they're scaling, they're trying to bring people in and it's very easy for a resume to fall through the cracks. Um, so, I mean, don't hit them with a resume every week. <laughs> but, like, if you, if you send a resume and you don't hear anything back, uh, you know, three months later, maybe try again um, if you're still looking. Um, it's, it's not going to hurt your chances to, to keep um, reaching out. Mm -hmm. if, the, if you have an opportunity to face to face, that always seems to help. Like yeah. the resume mm -hmm. in hand, yeah. talking with someone. So if there's career fairs or something mm -hmm. similar, yeah. super helpful. Any other last burning questions? Anybody wants to? Okay. Well, I think I'll. Um, if anybody does, they can come on down. But um, I, I'm going to ask the same question that I asked the first group this morning. If you could use a time machine to go back in time and visit a younger self. Is there any advice that you would give to a younger, younger you? Um, well, I repeat what I said a few minutes ago, which is uh, I would tell my younger self to learn how to manage your time and prioritize uh, your work. Uh, I, I never did that. Uh, during my master's or my PhD. Um, uh, and the second thing that I would tell myself is to, uh, I guess, exercise regularly. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious though, because I, I started doing that uh, a year and a half ago after neglecting it uh, since we started Canopy. And it's had an incredibly positive impact uh, in my life. Yeah. I, I have more energy, I, I'm in a better mood at the end of the day. Um, so yes, those are the two things that I would tell myself. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had have discovered Ruby, which is a programming language earlier. Um, <laughs> I had always, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd coded for a long time, C++, Python, and I, I, I found the value in it. I could get stuff done. Um, and then when I found this language Ruby, it's the one that like sort of clicked. I saw the beauty in it, and that's when it, coding went from something I did to get stuff done to like the thing I became passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that everyone in the room Ruby's going to be their answer. You know, the, we have these ideas of like Java minds working in Ruby, which is terrible, or Ruby minds working with Java, which is terrible. But just experiment, play around with things, um, find the thing. You know, maybe none click, but if you don't like coding now there might actually be some part of coding that you really do like. You just need to find mm. that niche. Um, so that would have been advice I would have liked to give myself when I was 16. Awesome, Bridget. I would say it's OK to change your mind often. I think I struggled a lot with, all right, well, I did controls. Now I want to do theoretical physics. But I'm going to be behind. And do I really want academia? Like, mm. I kept trying to find the long-term career with each of my tangents that I took, and I think I found that very stressful, so I always second-guessed those choices. But the experiences I've had at each tangent have been invaluable, and 10 years later, they're all coming together. I use all of that skill set now, and it's made me a much stronger individual, both as an employee for SpaceX, but just in projects that I work on my own, and taking away some of that um, I guess hesitation and 
potential doubt of, is that the right choice to keep switching between engineering and physics or something else? It would have, mm -hmm. could have been a little bit happier in, in those times. Okay, well, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna head to our break now. And again, we have kind of an extended break so that you can, like a half hour break, so that you can have a chance to chat. And I think all of our panelists are gonna be around for that break. And you can take advantage of a face-to-face -face moment with someone in a startup, right? So if you're thinking about it, here's your chance. So don't let them out of your sight. <laughs> okay, let's thank our panelists again. Thank you so much.